also important for all of us in our interactions with each other. And so it is a great privilege for us to be a part of this. We are grateful to the director of the Institute for this opportunity he's given us to have this interaction with each other. And also we are grateful to Dr. Abu Bakari, Asiatu Abu Bakari, who did all the hard work so that we could meet here. I'll hand you over to our chair for today's seminar, Dr. Chika Imba, who is a research fellow with the Religions and Philosophy section of the issues of African Studies. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. It's always a joy to join the issue of African Studies uh, where all the important conversations uh, in the university happen. Uh, Richmond has been promising me that <laughs> when I was still organizing the seminars, uh, it promised me forever that this talk will happen. Uh, it's a pleasant surprise that, um, well, it's a pleasant thing, not surprising anymore, that uh, the opportunity has now come and he's able to join us at the seminar series. And then I'm enthusiastic about it. I know I have attended a number of um, Dr. Chris's uh, presentations. And I can tell you that uh, you should expect a very exciting, a very logical um, presentation. Um, all the powers uh, you find in any kind of philosophical inquiry, you expect that and more. Uh, as again, he joins him, he, he puts him, himself out there to join one of the most um, important conversations in contemporary African philosophy. Um, sufficiently controversial as indeed every other philosophical problem. And of course the issue, uh, like every other philosophical question uh, is fundamental, particularly to the African continent where we struggle with uh, the basic problem of organizing our societies. And um, so it's about the question of democracy and consensus, you know, which is uh, an, a, a topic that was given uh, plenty of salience by the seminar work of uh, our own professor, which uh, we do now of blessed memory. He left us last year. Uh, um, so he introduced this debate. And uh, I know a number of colleagues and friends in philosophy who have published, who have continued to publish important works in response, in agreement or in disagreement, or moving beyond the uh, we reduce uh, views uh, as expressed in the 80s, 90s. So, without much ado, I'll bring in uh, Dr. Wesi, who is um, currently a senior lecturer uh, at the Department of Philosophy and Classics uh, here at the University of Ghana. He does that or that on enviable job of coordinating uh, uh, the University of Ghana required courses. Um, we all know. Uh, he, he obtained his PhD from the University of Cape Town uh, and he was also a, a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the American uh, University of uh, Cairo. His research interests, as you will imagine, uh, are in uh, analytic philosophy, philosophy of language and logic, those, those more scary areas of philosophy. That's what he does. And then, of course, uh, he has plenty of interest in African philosophy from where this particular topic originates, uh, Professor Dr. Kushi. Thank you very much. Um, let me start sharing my screen now. Okay, um, thank you very much for coming. And um, as the chair introduced, um, it's just a, an ongoing debate in the in philosophy, mostly in African philosophy, 
And um, what I'm going to do is to try and approach some of the debates from an analytic perspective. So the talk is the will to consensus, and I'm going to, um, why focusing so much on, on radio, but I'm going to broaden the discussion to any ways of thinking that um, to have a consensual democracy would um, require some sort of a will, a will to compromise, a will to, um, to consensus, and a will to the pursuit of consensus. Okay, so the outline of my presentation is going to be um, there's a four parts. I'm going to talk about um, this will to consensus, the pursuit to consensus, and consensual democracy briefly. And then I'll try to raise some conceptual difficulties with positing that there is a will to consensus. And then I'll raise some objections to that. And if you agree with some of the objections and the difficulty that I'll pose, at the end of the talk, what I want to suggest is that uh, one, that the pursuit of consensus isn't necessarily an ideal and isn't necessarily intrinsic to consensual democracy. And the thought that consensual democracy implies having a non-party system um, would also be um, um, refuted in a way. That's if you uh, agree with the, um, with the propositions that I'm going to make. And then to you know, further say that well, rather than focusing so much on there being a will or the pursuit of consensus, we should think of consensus as an emergent property, right? Not something that is premeditated and that is not something that we bring into the liberation. Um, I hope my, my, my thoughts and my arguments might be convincing. So right from the onset, I am not saying that consensus is not an idea. And I'm not saying that the pursuit to consensus is not um, you know, um, opposite. Um, what I'm saying is that um, the pursuit of consensus and consensus building or having a will to consensus isn't essential to having a consensual democracy. And um, the other aspect of it is that, well, we can still attain consensus. We can still think of, of, of consensual democracy even within a multi-party system so that the two are not antithetical to each other. So um, over the years, really, when others have argued for consensual democracy, and they trace its roots to you know, pre-colonial African traditional societies. And the thought is that in those societies, there weren't political parties. So to, you know, to restore that kind of um, value or political system will require that there shouldn't be any political parties. In place of that, we can have political associations or other forms of organization. But the point is um, to do away with political parties in order to reinstitute um, consensual democracy. And I am saying that from the talk and the implications of what I'm going to say, um, we, can, we can see that the ideal, uh, consensus and ideal and consensus um, as a value can still be pursued even within a multi-party system. That it doesn't really require there to have a non-party system. That's if the argument holds. Okay. So uh, briefly, um, so consensual democracy um, has been postulated by African philosophers um, as a way of uh, dissatisfaction with the current political system. And why? So we have a multi-party liberal system, majoritarian system, and we all see the ills of that. I'm not going to rehash all the ills of majoritarian or multi-party system. But the thought is that we need the, what, what is wrong with African political systems or governments is really to do with the form and the type of political system that is being practiced. Um, and the form and the type that is being practiced, you know, we'll see is more liberal, multi-party, majoritarian democracy. And the thought is that we need to have something that is authentic, something that is more African in nature, something that responds um, our political system before the onset of coloniality. So something that is more indigenous. And the thought is that, well, let's look to our traditional societies, pre-colonial societies, and we'll see that the kind of political system that was organized then was consensual democracy. It was a non-party system. 
So if we're going to, um, or if we are interested in searching for a democratic system that is more African in nature, that is um, geared towards restoring some of our values, then consensual democracy is the best way to go. So um, it is not to say that in every decision um, we have to attain consensus. Some argue, argue that um, it is more to do with uh, consensus in terms of you know, agreed actions, what to do, not necessarily in terms of values or in terms of um, morals, but more to do with actions or what ought, or what, what is it that we have to do um, in order to move the society forward. So consensual democracy um, in its um, original conception is a non-party system that is geared towards having a consensus at the mood of decision making. So the process, the process, the procedural process of this system is consensual. And the decisions that are made or decisions that are arrived at is also consensus. So it is consensus both in decision or the end result of deliberation and consensus also in the process or the procedural um, um, deliberations that we, we engage in. And the, the thought is that, well, the traditional African societies were consensual, not only because of the fact that there were no organized political parties, but that, that the people shared what we call the will to consensus. So we've heard of the phrase of our elders, you know, sitting around the tree or under the tree and talking to the agree. Why? Because they had this will to consensus. They had this disposition, this frame of mind to come to an agreement. So even when they sit under the tree and they are discussing, um, they have in mind to arrive at a consensus at the decision. And consensus, of course, is not the same as um, unanimity. So they don't expect that every single person, but consensus that even those who may have different views might come to be um, to see the light, so to say. Or uh, it's, a, it's a process of adjusting and accommodating other views in order to arrive at a decision that is favorable to all. And that's the nature of, of consensus. So, so there was, a, there was a, a vigorous pursuit of consensus, which was fueled by this will to consensus. And sometimes we have, you know, we say people don't have the political will. So there's this, this will that drives them to come to um, a meeting, to dialogue, and to arrive at, at a consensual decision. But not only that, the kind of deliberations that were involved were also non-adversarial, unlike in a, in a multi-party dispensation where discussions tend to be more adversarial. And it is also marked by the fact that political parties are in there to win power. And when they win power, it's phenomenon of winner take it all. So they are not really interested in getting everyone on board. For us in the traditional setting, because there were no um, organized political parties, it was easier to pursue consensus, because that is driven by having that frame of mind, that will to come to a discussion or to have that rational dialogue, accommodate people's views, adjust your own views, and then come to an agreement. So um, in the diagram as I tried to show, you can see there's some intimate connection between the will to consensus and the pursuit of consensus. And of course, the pursuit of consensus, the world of consensus determines the kind of deliberation that also takes place. So the deliberations are going to be more um, non-adversarial. It's going to be marked by some mutual accommodation, all because of the idea that we're trying to achieve consensus or an agreement. Now, what, what is very interesting about, about this is the kinds of things that um, researchers, especially Reiki, have said about the will to consensus. In one quote, it says, where there is a will to consensus, dialogue can lead to a willing suspension of disagreement. Right? There has to be a will to consensus, and that will inform, you know, your suspending your own views if you think that, you know, it is going to drive the discussion forever, and that you need to accommodate your views to be able to move on. But not only that, um, Reid also says that not all disagreements obviously can be resolved into consensus in all circumstances. 
there has to be a will to consensus in the first place. The African elders had that kind of a will, and it is most certainly absent in the motivation underlying a political party. So here we see a contrast between consensual democracy as traditionally practiced, because one, they had that kind of will, and that will led them to pursue consensus. And the deliberations were marked by features of consensus, like accommodation of views, um, respect, compromise, in order to arrive at a decision. And the thought is that you know, when we contrast that with multi-party systems, um, that is not marked, or the underlying principles, or the animating principles and you know, um, underlying political, the formation of political parties isn't necessarily to achieve consensus, but just to, to win um, um, political power. And so um, the elders had that kind of a will, and that led to the pursuit of consensus. And if we want to restore consensus, then we need to have a non-party system, because a non-party system will restore that kind of shared will to consensus and the pursuit of consensus. Okay, so I think I've um, um, given you, um, you know, some um, background to consensual democracy and the various things they say um, with respect to the will to consensus as a frame of mind that you bring into deliberation. And in order to pursue consensus and to arrive at a consensual decision. And that this mode of, of you know, political arrangement is distinct, is contrary to what we observe in, in, in contemporary societies. And so if you want to restore consensual democracy, go back to our indigenous groups. That will necessarily imply there being a non-party system and a big vigorous pursuit of consensus, both procedurally and also in the decision that are arrived at. Okay. Um, so uh, just a few things that I've said so far, that the will to consensus um, was a key virtue in the traditional African politics, and that the African elders shared a will to consensus, even though they held divergent opinions, right? There were disagreements, all right, but they had the shared will to consensus. And you know, the contrast, while pre-colonial African elders pursued consensus by adjusting interests, uh, multi-party democracy or the kinds of democracy we have it now, um, adopt some sort of adversarial approach to politics, silencing and suppression of dissenting views, because the goal there and the motive there is mostly to win political power. So the call for a non-party form of democracy by consensus and seeks to preserve this connection between the pursuit of consensus and the will to consensus that inspires it. Okay. Now, I'm going to um, raise, raise um, five key um, points in, in, in this talk um, after the introduction that I've just given. And um, I guess the points will be clearer as I move on. So the first point I want to make um, in response to this picture that I've just uh, painted, is that there are some conceptual inconsistencies when we suppose that there has to be a will to consensus prior to, and this will is supposed to supervene on the rational discussion of um, deliberators. So that's the first point that I'm going to make. That there are difficulties in making that kind of supposition that there is a will to consensus that comes prior to deliberation. The next point I'm going to make is that even if we assume that there is a will to consensus, I want to say that the will to consensus is inessential to rational deliberation. In other words, it's also deficient in explaining why that is requisite or even required for there to be um, 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 a consensual form of democracy. Now, the third point I want to make is, so the first two points are mostly to do with the will to consensus and some conceptual difficulties with that. But even where we think that the will to consensus um, animates the pursuit of consensus, that will lead to a decision by consensus. I also want to suggest that um, this picture doesn't take seriously the issue of pluralism and genuine disagreement. But if we really, um, take seriously 
um, genuine disagreement, as I will explain, and aspects of pluralism, we will see that the pursuit of consensus may not necessarily be ideal. And the fourth point I want to make is that, that the will to consensus, and even the pursuit of consensus, stifles and constrains deliberation and deliberators, and that positing a will to consensus doesn't make deliberation free. And I'll, I'll explain that literally. And finally, I want to say that consensus um, should be understood as an emergent property of deliberation. So that it is that deliberators have to have this frame of mind or disposition to go into deliberation, going there to pursue consensus. But rather, um, we shouldn't have that as a democratic society, we shouldn't have that will to go and dialogue. But consensus is an emergent property, just as dissensus can also emerge, just as compromise can emerge, or no decision at all, that it shouldn't be uh, what is characteristic of deliberation, but something that is an emergent property that emerges from uh, our discussions. And if, if we understand consensus as an emergent property, and that um, the, the, the will to consensus, the pursuit to consensus isn't ideal, but rather, that doesn't mean that we have to abandon consensus, but it's something that emerges. And so based on the particularities of the issue, we can have a consensus or we may not have. But the consensus now, because it is not a prison of a non-party system, but it's an emergent property, it's possible for it to emerge even in a multi-party adversarial um, kind of framework. So these are the five points that I'm going to, um, to highlight briefly, and then I bring my talk to a close. Okay, so the first point, um, um, why do I say that the presence of the will to consensus and the pursuit of consensus is conceptually inconsistent, um, and there are some deficiencies in that, and I'll, I'll raise just one, one point there. So in, in the literature, we make a distinction between different types or senses of consensus. And, and Ray do and I say, well, the type of consensus that we are interested in is decisional consensus or consensus in terms of agreement with respect to actions. Not necessarily cognitive or theoretical consensus, agreement on matters of truth or belief. And not necessarily um, consensus with respect to value, so agreement in matters of what ought to be done or you know, moral disputes and all that. So the, the thought is that, well, if there are moral disputes and ethical disputes and disputes about value, may, consensus may not be an ideal, right? A way of um, trying to resolve that dispute because the dispute to do with value. And in, in matters of cognitive consensus, matters of truth and beliefs, well, it is not an ideal to pursue consensus, right? But really say that um, where rational discussion is serious enough, right, and the will is there in the first place, it can still lead to consensus, even in these other aspects of, or, or these other types of consensus. Okay, now here's the conceptual inconsistency here. So let's assume there is a will to consensus, a will, a frame of mind, exposition that allows us to come to a deliberation in order to achieve consensus. But there are different forms of consensus. So imagine if we are going to talk about an action to take, then I go to deliberation with a frame of mind for consensus. Then I can switch from having a frame of mind or consensus to something that is non-consensual. And that, that, that presents some sort of a conflict of the will. And it will be switching from one, from the from a will to consensus to a non-will to consensus, depending on the issue to be to be to be discussed. And that doesn't seem to be um, um, sustainable. So either you have a if you have a will and you're going to have that kind of frame of mind or disposition, if you have a will to consensus, then it shouldn't really matter. Um, um, that the will only should be applicable to certain aspects of issues. If it's a matter of um, actions, then you should have that kind of will. But if it's a matter of value, you shouldn't have that kind of will. Well, then, then it becomes very um, inaccurate, historically speaking, to say that the traditional elders shared that kind of a will. If they shared that kind of a will, if they had that will, 
And it's the will that animates their pursuit of consensus. And it's that will that is what is absent in contemporary multi-party systems. Then that will to consensus should be reflected in every aspect of their decision. But if that is not the case, then that is very inconsistent to posit there be a will to, to consensus. If there is a will to consensus, and um, that will is only applicable to pragmatic issues, um, then the will to consensus is just arbitrary. Right? So you, 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 you go into that frame of mind if it's about a pragmatic issue. You leave that frame of mind if it is not. And that seems uh, quite um, implausible to, to assume so. But maybe they might say, well, the will to consensus animates all other aspects of consensus. Well, if the will to consensus applies to all issues, pragmatic, normative, evaluative, yes, then there will be consistency in the will, all right. But then what is the point of, of drawing the distinction between these types of consensus? Because um, the way in which um, or the procedures for arriving at decisions um, differs in the various types of consensus, in the various types of consensus. And when it comes to normative and cognitive consensus, um, really when I have to say, well, here yeah, it's more to do with numbers, not necessarily that a decision that is favorable to all. Um, if it's more to do with value, then it's not really about having a consensus per se. So, well, then, then you know, on the one hand, if we posit the will to consensus to be only applicable to pragmatic issues, we have the problem of a conflict of will. And if we decide to say that, well, it's applicable to all, or, or all the different types of consensus, so then we also run into a problem of, um, then there is no informative distinction between the types of consensus. And there's no need to posit that there are different procedures for arriving at these at this types of consensus. But also, I mean, from a, from a logical point of view, um, a, um, the will to consensus is supposed to be anticipated to whatever consensual or decision that you arrive at. So as an antecedent condition, something that is prior to deliberation and deliberation, antecedent conditions are not necessarily um, necessary conditions. Um, from a logical point of view, an antecedent condition is not a necessary condition. So the presence, the presence of an antecedent condition does not imply logically that you know a, a consensual decision will take place. And really you and others admit that that the fact that we are pursuing consensus doesn't necessarily mean or imply that there's going to be a consensual decision. Fair enough. But the reverse does hold. The absence of the will, right? the antecedent condition when it is absent, again, does not logically imply that then there wouldn't be the pursuit of consensus. I hope you get the, the logical distinction there. So if you think the will to consensus is an antecedent condition for the pursuit of, cons of consensus, on the one hand, that antecedent condition is not necessary for the pursuit of consensus. That is why you can still have the pursuit, you can still have the will, and not necessarily yield a consensual decision. That is admitted by proponents of consensual democracy. But what is not admitted, and what they actually say, is that the absence of that, and that is why in a multi-party system, because there is no will to consensus, they cannot arrive at a consensual decision. And the thought is that the absence of the anticipated condition does not imply that the, um, the consequence will not hold. So you can still have the consequence, the, the consensual decision um, holding, even if the anticipated condition does not, um, does not apply. This is a, a logical um, problem. But of course, um, the, 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 the insight here is not really about all, but the, the insight here is to say that um, um, whether it is a cognitive or um, an normative issue, uh, the will to consensus is not required, uh, is not a requisite for engaging a consensual um, decision. Okay. Um, and the, the next thesis is that, I said, as I said, is explanatory deficient to posit there being a will to consensus. Of course, um, um, there's a conceptual and a historical dimension to that. If you think that African elders shared that kind of a will, shared that kind of a will, and the reason why there was that kind of a will is because they 
the political arrangement there was a non-party system. There were no organized political parties. And so um, you are not going there for power. Right? You are going there to discuss issues. And the point is that, well, in the restoration of our traditional political system, we have to pursue a non-party system. Now, what this means is that it makes, it makes the will to consensus um, dependent on the political arrangement that you have. Here, politics, uh, political phenomena, is being used as a basis to justify a psychological phenomenon. The will to consensus is psychological, a frame of mind. Um, a non-party system is politics, a political in the, in the uh, public domain. So we have a public phenomenon and a mental individual um, phenomenon or a psychological phenomenon. How one supervenes on the other is philosophically, um, um, to say, not uh, plausible. So most philosophers have argued, you know, that's a similar thing like the is ought um, distinction. So you can use um, an is or a descriptive um, proposition to to judge, to evaluate, or to assess a non or prescriptive one. Or you can't use the S to justify an ought. In the same way, we can use the psychology to justify the political. And, and the reverse is also the same. We can use the political domain as a basis for something psychological. So um, from a conceptual point of view, it will seem that the, uh, the disposition to pursue a particular value in this particular case, uh, consensus, a particular value, is going to be dependent on the kind of political arrangement in place. So a non-party political arrangement is going to, you know, the value there is consensus and it's animated by a disposition to pursue consensus. But a disposition um, from a, in a philosophy of mind, um, it's, not, um, it's not the determining factor for a political arrangement. Or, in other words, the existence of a will to consensus, which is a psychological frame of mind, cannot plausibly be appended to the type of political organization that exists in a particular society. Well, I know I have a lot of time, but um, so I don't have how many 10 minutes more. So, a restitution, a restitution of the non party system makes the relation of the continuity of the will to consensus, rather system, systemic, not, uh, not systematic, but systemic rather than a human affair, uh, if you give it a simplistic one. So let's imagine that our elders had this kind of a will, they pursued consensus, and they arrived at consensual decision. But our African elders, I mean, um, Africans, we haven't changed, have we? So you expect that since they are our you know, our predecessors, since they are our forefathers, if the will to consensus is requisite for any, and as I said, it's not really dependent on the political arrangement, we would expect that we as Africans should also have that same political will, we should also have that same frame of mind. Now, the thought is that a consensual democracy, because it's now going back to this roots, to the original indigenous pattern, is going to restore a non-party system, and with it, bring in this frame of mind. So somehow, the disposition to consensus disappeared with the absence of a non-party. So the introduction of the party system somehow, you know, got rid of the pursuit to consensus or the, the frame of mind. And now if we restore it, then somehow it re-emerges, right? So then we have now this position to pursue consensus. That seems to be um, that seems to make the continuity between consensus or the pursuit of consensus, the will to consensus, and the political arrangement, not a matter of human affair, right? Not that people have it, but it's more to do with a systemic one. It's more to do with the kind of political arrangement you have. If you have a political arrangement which is non-consensual, which is non-party, like what we have now, then there is no disposition to pursue consensus. But if there's a consensual democracy, then somehow there is a pursuit to consensus or there's a disposition to consensus. And that makes the continuity there 
um, the continuity, the, uh, not the human affair, but more to do with a systemic affair to do with the kind of political arrangements that you have. Okay. Um, and, and I would say, of course, the changes in our democratic regimes and political structures cannot be used to account for the absence or the presence of such a mental disposition. Okay. Um, so let me go to the, the third proposition that is that consensual democracy and the pursuit of consensus doesn't take seriously the issue of pluralism and disagreement. And I'm going to give it a, a distinct view of disagreement. Um, of course, there were disagreements in traditional societies. There are different kinds of disagreements, but I'm, I'm going to focus on a particular kind of disagreement that we call content disagreement. Um, you might even think of it as persistent disagreement. And I'm going to use that um, this unique type of disagreement to question whether the will to consensus or the pursuit of consensus is ideal. Um, and if it's not, then the point I'm making here is that it does not take seriously the issue of disagreement. So when two people are in disagreement um, about P, uh, there is supposed to be a, a certain intuition of conflict or tension. And this conflict or tension is, is you know, expressed in terms of an incompatibility or an inconsistency between their beliefs or their attitudes or their acceptances. And uh, the incompatibility is such that one, 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 one precludes the other. So that's why we are in the disagreement. An acceptance of one he precludes the other and it rules out the other. Of course, not every form of disagreement is, and that's why it's a unique or distinct type of disagreement. If it comes to matters of taste, right? If it's, if it's uh, um, tasty to you and it's not tasty to me, you might be disagreeing, but it's not really about that yours is mine. So this is a very unique type of disagreement. And you might think it's uh, more to do with cognitive form of disagreement where one precludes or the other. So the reasoning here is, is you know, quite simple. Um, So I don't want to do much of it, but uh, it's English. So if A and B disagree, and there is something that they are they disagree on, and if they are in disagreement, then A believes or accepts P. And you can do so by action a sentence S that expresses the proposition that P. But B believes or rejects P by action a sentence T that expresses the denial of P. That's why they are in disagreement. And um, so you can see that if A believes or accepts P and B disbelieves or rejects P, then we can say that there's a tension, there's a disagreement there. Now let's assume that A and B, as we do and others say, in the traditional African societies, they shared similar interests and that one ought to adjust their individual interests to that of the community. That is why we can achieve consensus because we accommodate we adjust our interest in order to accommodate other views. Well, if that's the case, then we can assume, uh, if that assumption holds, then B will have to adjust the not P to P in order to be able to coincide with what A is saying. Um, if he doesn't adjust it to P by, by forgoing not P, he may have to adjust it to say P prime, where A was have to adjust his P to P prime. Right? So all those adjustments take place. But um, so then if, if adjustment can take place because of similarities of interest, then the point is that there cannot be any tension or incompatibility between the two, uh, between A and B. So B is not P, then does not rule out or does not preclude A is P. If, if B is not P rules out or precludes A is P, then um, to forego that, to adjust that, will imply that there wasn't even an incompatibility in the first place. But P not P to say, well, then um, I forgo not to be to come to P. Well, then there wasn't a tension in the first place, or well, all because of the similarity of interest that we share. And the thought is that, well, if there were genuine disagreements, then it could not have been 
disagreement according to content disagreement or cognitive disagreements and moral disagreement. Disagreements where you know you one accepts some proposition and the other one rejects it. And here the rejection is a, a not P or um, a more of a logical kind of rejection. But you might say, well, there was disagreement. Well, if there was disagreement, then if A says not P and B says P, and somehow there's an adjustment from not P to P, um, that's, that's a resolution of the conflict. But the question then becomes, was that a legitimate avenue for resolving conflicts? That, you know, in the face of opposition, you forgo not P in order to come for the sake of consensus, right? And um, some researchers want to say, well, um, you don't necessarily have to forgo not to be all because of consensus. But in the face of persistent disagreements, you ought to latch on to the not to be, especially where it is incompatible. Not necessarily that you have to yield that for the sake of consensus. And when it comes to persistent disagreements, consensus to do with value and morals, you know, that it doesn't seem to be that the legitimate avenue to, to, to take is to adjust and accommodate and come to a conflict by foregoing not P. When not P is you know, opposed to P or when not P is logically inconsistent or incompatible with P. So uh, a unique sense of disagreement um, in this way in which we are couching it um, seems to make one, um, that the notion of there being a pursuit of consensus, not a legitimate avenue for resolving conflicts. And even if there was, uh, we will see that the fact that there is shared, you know, similar interest and adjustment of interest means that there wasn't genuine disagreement in the first place. And the kinds of things I've said so far, we can say a similar thing to, you know, about pluralism, as Rawls have, um, have, have said, the diversity of religious, philosophical, and moral doctrines found in modern democratic societies is not a mere historical condition that may soon pass away. It is a permanent historical condition. And so some people think that taking diversity and pluralism seriously requires that we abandon uh, the pursuit of consensus. And for other, the pursuit of consensus that may eliminate conflicts and pluralism. So, but I, I'm not taking the view that we should abandon consensus as I've made clear. And the same that the pursuit um, of consensus is not um, um, essential to democracy. Um, let me go to the fourth, the fourth um, thesis, um, which is freedom of deliberation. And the thought is here um, the way we conceive of the relation between an action and the will. So we'll be talking about the will to consensus uh, supervening on the kind of deliberation that takes place. And uh, uh, interesting quotes from Arendt, and I think the insight there is very um, important. So action to be free must be free from motive on one side, from its intended goal as a predictable effect on the other. Right? So if deliberation, is supposed to be an action or an act that we are going to engage in. It should be free from the motive, the will. And it should be free from, from a predictable effect. This is not to say that motives and aims are not important factors in every single act, but they are its determining factors. And action is free to the extent that it is able to transcend them. In the, in the view that I had expressed earlier on, this consensual democratic point of view. It doesn't seem to divorce the, the mind. It doesn't seem to divorce the motive. It doesn't seem to divorce the psychology from the action. It sees that the psychological moment, the frame of mind, the disposition, is what determines the nature of the deliberation. It's also what informs the kind of decision that it's um, agreed on. And that seems to be contrary to what I already saying here, that actions to be free ought to be free from the motive that animates it and also the effects of what we're going to, to have. So um, what, is, what, is, what is supposed to be the principle that is supposed to guide deliberation is not the motive, it's not the will, but what I rent calls the principle. Principle. 
So action in so far as it is seen is neither under the guidance of the intellect nor under the dictates of the will, although it needs both for the execution of any particular goal, but springs from something altogether different, which I shall call a principle. Principles do not operate from within the self as motives do, but inspire, as it were, from without. And principles, we can evaluate principles on the basis of um, you know, universal validity. It's a principle universally valid. We can evaluate principles on the basis of replicability. Can we replicate this principle? But the will isn't something that can have that kind of universal validity. It cannot be replicated, or of course, we can have the same will, but it's not something that we can transfer from one to the other. And, and, and so uh, this last quote is very interesting. Freedom or its objects appears in the world whenever such principles are actualized. The, the appearance of freedom by the manifestation of principles coincides with the performing act. Men are free, are distinguished from their possess possessing the gift of freedom as long as they act, neither before nor after. For to be free and to act are the same. So what I glean from this discussion is that the will to consensus constrains the discussion and discussion's capacity to pursue other ideas. Why? Because you come to the discussion with a frame of mind to pursue consensus. So whatever is going to happen, you are motivated by appeal to consensus. It doesn't make you, it constrains you from pursuing other ideas because of the will that is animating your pursuit of consensus. But more importantly, that rational dialogue, the deliberation that everybody is talking about in a democratic society, seems to now be under the sway of the psychological and disastic attitudes, rather than by the principles of deliberation. And the question is, why isn't the principle of deliberation enough? Right? Why do we need to posit there to be a psychology, a will, and then try to say, well, rational deliberation is not by itself sufficient for attaining consensus. We need something else. And, um, and, and, and so that will make the deliberators not free um, to deliberate because they are constrained by, by the will. And so um, it is not only in consensus. So in our political um, dispensation, um, so the one who is in the minority in an opposition, you know, bears that label seriously. And all that he is going into parliament to do is what? Is to oppose, right? Again, that is having a frame of mind that I'm also still arguing against. So the point is not to go there with that frame of mind to say, I am going to oppose. And the point is not to say that I'm going to the parliament or to discussion with a frame of mind for consensus. The point is that the psychology does not determine or she must supervene on the kind of deliberation that goes. Yours is better to go there to dialogue. And that consensus or opposition is supposed to be an emergent property rather than a characteristic feature of the political arrangement. And so um, in that particular, uh, in this particular way of conceiving things, when we go into deliberation, I may oppose your, your views. And I can still hold on to my view and oppose whatever, without necessarily being tagged as an opposition member. And in another, in another discussion, I may not oppose, but rather come to a consensus. That, that to propose or to arrive at a consensus is something that emerges out of the particularities of the discussion. And so when we, we understand that consensus is an, you know, an emergent property, then the, the, the point here is that in a multi-party system like what we have now, the focus is not to be, or it's not to say that let's try to have a non-party consensual democracy, which is like what you had in pre-colonial African societies, where there was a will to consensus. But rather, even within a multi-party system of democracy, the pursuit of consensus can still take place. But here, it is not conceived as an ideal. It's not conceived as you know, um, the process for attaining um, or coming to a decision. But it's something that emerges. It's, a, it's an emergent property based on, on deliberation. So rational deliberation, rational discussion, the accommodation of views, all of those things are very important and crucial. And I think that we ought to stop there rather than 
to posit one, a will to that will inform the kind of deliberation that is supposed to have, or you know, a consensual decision that ultimately ought to arise. Right? So we make it seem that that's the ideal to pursue when it may not necessarily be ideal in every circumstance. So we should rather be content with having a will to dialogue. In a democratic society, we have the will to come together to dialogue. Whether we will come to a consensual decision is based on well, the nature of the dialogue we're going to have um, and the particularities of the issue. And not that a consensual decision making is a given, not that consensus at the goal is a principle to, um, to you know, strive at, and not that we should come to deliberations with a will to consensus. Okay, so now what is the whole point? So um, we take out the will to consensus. Uh, we take out the pursuit of consensus. Then we are left with just, you know, deliberative model, which is rational dialogue, which accommodation, respect, reciprocity. Um, and then a decision that is going to be, that is going to emerge out of it can be based on compromise or consensus or, uh, you know, or no decision at all. Okay, so now my conclusion. Uh, if 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 what I have said, and if you accept the thesis that I've um, outlined, in, um, the first one of the conceptual inconsistencies in the supposition that there's a will to consensus that is prior to and supervenes on rational discussion, and if you agree with me that the will to consensus is inessential to rational deliberation because it doesn't really explain um, the method of decision making, and that it doesn't take seriously the issue of disagreement and pluralism. And if you agree that the will to consensus stifles and constrains deliberation and deliberate, that it doesn't make deliberators free. And if you agree that consensus should be understood as an emergent phenomenon, then it is a very long route to come and say that consensual democracy or consensus as we all want. If we want to bring in the traditional African way of achieving consensus, we should not necessarily do away with multi-party systems, but it is compatible with multi-party system. Why? Because it's now conceived as an emergent property. All other conditions for we can still pursue or can still have you know, consensus, not as a pursuit, not as a goal, but something that emerges even within a multi-party system. And if the pursuit and the will to consensus is inessential to consensual democracy, then of course there is no antithesis here. There's no saying that, well, they had that will, we don't have it. So to restore it, we need to have a will. Well, we don't necessarily need to have that will because we can still pursue, um, uh, come to a, an agreement on decisions on what to do, whether it's cognitive or uh, normative or pragmatic. We can still arrive at those decisions without necessarily thinking that um, there is a psychology, a frame of mind animating it, and there is a conscious premeditated effort to pursue it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richmond, for that inspiring the usual um, analysis. I'm sure there will be plenty of uh, fireworks out there for you. Um, but um, so uh, from what I said, I see that most of your uh, logical arguments are very persuasive, especially by the time you got in Adam. Um, but what I kept wondering from beginning to end is um, about, um, so I didn't, I realized I didn't spend a lot of time defining consensus. So what is consensus? Because I think that the very fact that that conceptual clarity, or that you haven't, I suspect, spent a lot of time characterizing, maybe I should move from just defining to characterizing consensus. What comes out of consensus? Could there be degrees of consensus? I just think that that's, that's probably part of I, like I said, I'm not, I don't have too much problems with the more patient analysis. Uh, uh, I mean, logical argument leading, leading to your conclusions. 
although I do suspect that I will have an issue with the last but one conclusion, but uh, what is consensus? Is it possible that um, when people come to deliberation, um, that if we break, if we characterize consensus and perhaps, uh, like I suggest, uh, stipulate that there could be de degrees or steps or to or different levels of consensus, uh, that um, people might actually have uh, a win to consensus to uh, certain kinds of degrees of agreement, but not have that will in other spheres, depending on what is at issue. Especially because for you and for we do, you make that distinction I noted between uh, 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 pragmatic uh, issues and uh, issues that are more theoretical, um, which I think might be more personal and a lot more difficult for people to come to the table with that um, um, sense of um, that will to consensus. But I should stop there because I think you already get where I'm going. Uh, um, and maybe because I'm asking that question of clarification, what you were thinking about consensus and how you have characterized consensus. Maybe you attend to that before we take the rest of the comments and questions. All right, so um, like every philosophical attend, um, it's always difficult to to have a, a, a precise definition. Um, so it's not really say to define, um, but um, there are certain characteristics of what makes it consensus or a consensual double caste system. So uh, the, 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 the main or the, the most important characteristic of, so, Think of democracy as you know, a political or a governance system. There's a way in which the liberators in this system can come to a decision. One way in which they can do is to use the majoritarian principle when we come, you know, so it is majority that carries the vote. So uh, the majoritarian principle may not necessarily be what is favorable to all, but it's only because of numbers. In consensus, uh, so we're characterizing um, a political system where the decision is not made on the base of numbers per se, but it's more to do with um, you know, a decision that is favorable to all. So we come to an agreement, um, not based on numbers, but based on um, what is to be done that is favorable to all. That is why in a consensual system, there is the adjustment and accommodation of views, and it's done in a non-adversarial manner because ultimately we want to come to a decision that is favorable to all. So favorable to all because um, we don't want to say that consensus is unanimity, right? but it is near unanimity. So it's not unanimity as in if there are 100 of us, then all 100 of us have to come to the right agreement. Um, but it's more to do to say that it is what is favorable to all. But I also made a distinction in the in the process, in the pro so consensus as a procedure and consensus as in the ultimate goal of decision making. So in, in it as a process, as a procedure, that is where there are certain classes like accommodating of views, adjustment of views, that is not found in a multi-party majoritarian democracy because. They are there, they, they came to power to, you know, is a winner takes all. So if the government in power says A, um, the opposition can decide to boycott, they wouldn't care. They will still go ahead and pass the bill. That will not happen in a consensual democracy because it is not uh, like a winner takes all uh, phenomenon. It is more to do with coming to an agreement that is collectively taken and favorable to all. So where there are opposition, that's why we talk till we agree. So where there's opposition, we we'll try to come to an agreement by adjusting, accommodating, and we do all these things in the, in the spirit of mutual respect, you know, reciprocity, so, and, and all of that. So it is more to do with the procedure and the, and the decision that's ultimately taken that characterizes it as consensual. 
And not, not that you can have a precise definition that will, we have come to a consensus. Oftentimes, actually, we have come to an agreement. But here, an agreement that is acceptable to all, um, to all in a way. Okay, uh, I will take comments, um, and maybe by the time the questions have been raised, then I will then return back to what I actually think uh, consensus is, and why I think that it might be the will to consensus does not do the kind of damage that you say it does. But then let me take comments and questions. Uh, I already have one online, but maybe we should be biased towards those uh, in location. Before, before I take the questions online. In location. Um, thank you. My name is uh, Miko Day. I'm actually from another university, uh, the College of Worcester. Um, thank you for your talk. I, I was just wondering how power comes in in this uh, sort of framework you're you are positing and thinking about social hierarchy within the society as well. So I was wondering, uh, if you could kind of expand on that a little bit, because I got a sense that either the social hierarchies were flattened in order to make sort of the argument you're making, or you know, you just didn't have time to kind of address that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Anthony from University of Ghana, philosophy department, and I happen to have a question. And my question was if we are to come to an agreement which is favorable to all, and I understand the fact that we from the explanation we just got, like consensus is supposed to be an emerging factor, then don't we think in some way it paves way for chaos in, in, in a sense to also emerge since we don't necessarily come with a mindset of coming to a specific agreement. Then if let's say A or B chooses not to adjust to fit into the criteria for an agreement to be made, then which best way will be which way would be best to go forward? Uh, thank you. I think now uh, from online. Okay, yeah. Um, Chika, thank you so much. And thank you, Richmond, for this enlightening um, talk. But my, my question, it's similar to what the first person raised. Um, you seem to have been quiet on structure, yet um, you place the work within African society. And I'm wondering whether the liberators are really free, you know, in the context of Africa, whether they are free, whether the world, the world to consensus is not really, is, is, is not really structured already for you to pursue towards consensus. So are, are the liberators really free to achieve outcomes of, of, of dialogue without structure? <clears throat> Thank you. I think that that question helps you are case more than harms you, <laughs> but let me take the hot one. Uh, okay, three females and um, philosophy department. Um, so in your characterization as to what consensus was, you highlighted the fact that both the procedural and the outcome plays a role, a role in defining what consensus is in the third place. If that is true, then the question then becomes how does a multi-party system achieve this consensus when you admit the fact that the multi party system, the individual access first of all, they uh, pursue their individual interests. So that would automatically eliminate the procedural parts because they really don't care about trying to have a discussion, and they are more concerned about protecting their individual interests. And also, to the multi party system, or in most multi party systems, what eventually happens is that there will be an eventual um, domination. Of two parties, which will which will then then dominate the discussion in the first place. This um, question is in relation to people, in relation to freedom and liberation, because the concern here is that the cycles opposing groups or minority, the multi-party system, there would eventually be a dominant two parties. That would mean that the rest of the group or the other parties would find it very difficult to have a voice in the first place. And so, in the spirit of consensus, how do we achieve that for the other parties that do not make into the discussion in the first place? Thank you very much. Those are very interesting questions. Um, so, in the spirit of consensus, uh, that, that is what I'm saying we shouldn't say. 
or we shouldn't. Uh, um, right. So, so, so basically, um, that we come into dialogue on an issue, but and then when you already have in the spirit of consensus, that will already constrain what we're going to do because now we're saying we have to necessarily come to a consensus. And uh, the, 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 the what I'm saying is not that consensus is not is bad. We should never attain consensus. Uh, what, what, what I'm saying is that consensus is not a pre it's not a precondition determinant of dialogue or deliberation. That it is something that can emerge out of deliberation. So if most of our deliberations it emerges that we come to a consensual agreement, fair enough. But not that, not that we wanted to come or achieve a consensus. That is why we came to the meeting or we came to the debate. So the, 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 the stifling or the constraint there is the, the motive, the psychology. That is, that would be, right? In the same way, if you have in mind to oppose because you are an opposition party, you probably will not be willing to accommodate other people's views because you come with a frame of mind to oppose. That is equally bad. So not to come with a frame of mind, but whether we're going to oppose or hold on to your views or accommodate is going to be dependent on, on that on, on the deliberation on that particular issue. And that is why even within the multi-party majoritarian system, right, if we if we think that consensus is not a preset of consensual democracy, but it's, it's, a, it's a property that can emerge from deliberation. Since a multi-party majority system is also a democratic system where people, the deliberators go to dialogue, um, uh, the point is that it can still emerge. Right? Um, so what we bemoan in our dispensation, our political system, is where you don't get anyone from, you know, so, so, so Imagine on the on free education, NDC, MPP both agree. So NDC comes to an agreement, even in parliament, to pass a bill on free education. They don't say I'm going to oppose it because I, you know, I'm in the opposition, but they come to an agreement on that. But then when it comes to building of the cathedral, you expect that people from the MPP will oppose that. Right? But, but you, you don't see that. You, you see that. If I'm going to oppose, I'm going to oppose on every issue. And if I'm for, you know, the proposition, I'm for every issue. And that's that's the the, the problem we have. So, uh, but if you don't have any predetermined mindset in this in this system of democracy that you know um, we and the rest are advocating, if we don't come with a premeditated will to consensus, um, it's possible to have someone who is NPP. You know, in Parliament, voting against against the building of the cathedral, but that same person will vote for, for instance, the free education. And you get someone from the opposition voting for, and so, but we don't have that because also, of course, there's uh, a few ills with our majoritarian system of democracy, but all those ones can be corrected. Uh, also, not don't, don't don't think too much in terms of the Ghanaian system, right? So. Um, for instance, in the Netherlands, they have more than 15 political parties and coming to a consensus. They are they, they come to consensus on so many on so many issues. Um, and maybe it's not as a two-party system like in Ghana or in the US. So majoritarian multi-party system in, it, in itself isn't um, um, isn't a two-party system. Or a, it, it's just a characteristic of what we observe, but that's not um, that, that's not the ideal, so to say. Um, so, so that there will be domination, two parties, whatever. Yes, it's, it's, it's a feature of the multi-party system. Um, let, let's not lose sight of the fact that um, I'm not arguing against consensual democracy. Right? So, you know, we can still institute you know, a way of instituting consensual democracy without necessarily having it a non-party form. It's a way of instituting a consensual process in deliberating, even if we have a majority multi-party system. Right? So um, I, I don't I don't see the two to be incompatible. Um, people think that, well, of course, the animating principles setting up political parties might be distinct from a non-party system, all right. But we see we try to see how 
even in a, a multi-party majority system can accommodate some of the goods from consensual democracy without the will and you know other things that I've, I've mentioned. So um, um, yes, the, 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 the two systems, if you look at how we do and others consider consensual democracy, it is seen to be antithetical to liberal form of majority democracy. Yes, the antithesis is there. But what is it? What is it so intrinsic and so crucial to consensual democracy? It's consensus and the pursuit of consensus and the will to consensus. And I'm saying that this, 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 this thing that are the, that seems to be the crux of consensual democracy is not a prison for that. You can still have those ones um, in multi-party states. When we raise issues, conceptual issues about consensus and um, um, in, um, the pursuit of consensus. So um, where, where the pursuit of consensus is not an ideal, it does not mean that we should not pursue consensus, right? So in that particular discussion of deliberation, we can pursue consensus. Um, but if you have some cognitive issues where consensus seems not to be the best way to go, we will not be forced to you know, arrive at a consensus because you know, we have seen that to be an ideal and we are pursuing consensus. So either you have to retreat and say, well, um, pursuit of consensus is ideal, but when it comes to matters of value and truth, don't see consensus. That doesn't seem to be a plausible um, take to, to, to make. Uh, my point is not to have that as an ideal, but of course, in certain matters and certain areas, consensus can prevail. In other cases, it need not, um, because it is not the, the yardstick for the liberation. And, and, and as I said, so the freedom here is that because we have a frame of mind that we bring into the liberation, um, in the multi-party system, again, there shouldn't be a frame of mind. So in the multi-party system, uh, the two parties where one is a position and the one is you know, for my majority or whatever, Again, when they come with a frame of mind, then they are making the psychology supervene on the political or on the, on the rational deliberation. So not to come with that frame of mind, but then to see how opposition and consensus emerges from, from deliberation. So I don't know they will not have much difference between you know, the traditional consensual system and the, the, the majoritarian system because none of them come to the discussion or to deliberation with a premeditated or a predetermined frame of mind or an ideal to pursue. So um, if, if you don't see yourself to be, in, you have the label opposition party, but you don't see yourself to be in opposition to whatever I'm going to say, and I don't see myself to be the majority of whatever I'm going to say, that's where we come to rational discussion and deliberation and consensus can emerge from that. So that is where I see the, Compatibility that when we see that consensus or the pursuit of consensus is not essential to a consensual democracy, it can be embraced even in a majoritarian um, system of democracy when we take away the frame of mind or the psychology from it. Um, so, so the, the question of what, well, if not a consensual agreement, then what is the best way? Well, but there's nothing wrong with having a majoritarian. Um, 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 decision, right? So um, even those who advocate for consensus, right, don't always say that in every issue attain consensus. So if it's to do with uh, some issues where consensus may not be may not prevail, and two people are being intransigent, they will never change their mind. Well, let's vote. So we vote, and it's eight out of you know, eight against two. Well, that is the decision we'll make, right? So, we, so here we start off, you know, in the discussion of deliberation, we might try to pursue consensus. Two people are being intransigent. We go with the majority, majority principle, but the majority principle in itself isn't a bad, a bad principle. It works and it works well in, in, in some ways. The, uh, the abuse of it is what we want to guard against, that we don't always, um, and, uh, we don't always stifle and suppress 
dissenting views. We let them express their views. That's why we are having a rational dialogue, accommodation of views. So we can, we can, it can be that there were, you know, when we started off five against five, after deliberations and stuff, we get eight against two. Now we can never talk to you know, that kingdom come. We have to make a decision. So decision is always something that we're going to have. Whether it's going to be a decision by consensus, it's not always going to be an idea. So we can still have a decision without it. Um, if we have, or if we have this way that um, uh, we'll, we'll power um, flattened structures. Right? So in a non-party system of democracy, where there are no political parties, there is organization, all right, but the political associations, they are not in there for, for power and they are not in there for the winner takes all. So you can have a library system that will do away with political parties. That seems to be more an ideal, not something realistic, so to say. So not to do away with, with political parties and not to do away much with structures, per se. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't have a um, an ultimate um, um, position on whether you should have parties, structures, or not. And the point is whether you get to have political parties or, or political associations or structures or whatever. Um, what, what I'm articulating here is that the process of deliberation and the decisions that are to be made um, can be done even, even um, um, without having a preconditioned state of mind to come and pursue consensus. That may not necessarily flatten any structures or that may not necessarily do away with structures. Um, in the traditional system, one might argue that there were no structures, but um, someone can also argue that there were in these structures. I mean, the and the elders will agree to the country and agree. They, they will talk to the country agreement. But of course, there were the chiefs, there were the Zepin, there were the hierarchies there, even though they were not organized hierarchies. Um, we can imagine some Ibusiapinis and elders were opposing certain, certain decisions, but they were not labeled as opposition elders. So they were not structured political parties, and yet there were um, you know, opposition or views that were. Um, you know, conflicts among them. And sometimes they can even discuss issues and not even come to a decision at all. Uh, it's possible. So um, a consensual decision-making process or consensus as the ultimate goal, um, I think, can be pursued um, without any recourse to structures. And even if there are structures, they can still be pursued. But as I mentioned, that the um, the political or the public arena is um, is not a determinant factor of whatever um, ideal or value ought to be pursued. So consensus is a value to be cherished, all right. Um, it's just not it's just not it's pursued. It's just not an ideal that ought to be made intrinsic or essential to a democracy. Uh, I don't know if um, that answers some of the questions. Thank you, Richmond. Uh, I'm sure there will be more questions, and I'll still come back. <laughs> so, so because you know, um, I, I grew up in the rural setting, and then uh, I used to. I, I, there's this uh, uh, lyric I used to hear whenever they set up a task force to go to someone's house to maybe seize the person's property because the person has run afoul of one of the communities uh, and so on. So you hear something like whatever they say, we must not listen. Whatever we say, they, they say, nobody should listen. We, 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 will not, we will not agree. So there is no will to any kind of agreement as they are going. They are not there for. So, and that usually leads to a lot of chaos because whether somebody's child is being trampled upon at that time, like maybe a baby fell from the mother's hand and the SAS force is moving into, they will just because. Whatever anybody says, we must not listen. So I'm wondering whether uh, you are not too quick to uh, assume that the will to consensus, because your main argument is that the will to consensus gratuitously circumscribes the liberation and the unforced agreement ultimately. Uh, so that's what you are saying. But uh, go back to philosophy. 
skepticism. It's either you are a skeptic, you are doubting in order to get clarity, or you're doubting to remain in doubt. And usually there is no redemption for somebody who is doubting to remain in doubt. So if there is no will to believe, William James, then even the idea of epistemology, the knowledge itself becomes defeated. So when there is no, so and you see in deliberations, I can tell you a, a number of distinct parts of the will to believe, uh, the will to, uh, uh, to consensus, and how that, and you will recognize them as serious problems that has also destroyed or undermined our democracy, ethnicity, religious bigotry, xenophobia. When people have this in their mind, in other words, I'm saying that those kinds of um, distempers that they ultimately undermine even that will to believe. And when they do that, when the will to believe is, is cut, what do you get? Ethnicity, ethnic violence, you know, religious violence, xenophobic violence. You see what I mean? You are also thinking of having some sort of monotypic unit right? and agreement of, of what is to be done or what ought to um, prevail. So the, the, the reverse also holds. I mean, when, when, when we are disagreeing on, on matters of value or cognition or whatever, and we have this will to come to a consensus, or ultimately we are coming to a monotypic agreement. One thing that we all would have to is favorable to all, but that can also translate into having this uh, homogeneous, um, and it will lead to the same biases that you are, you are describing in a way. Now, you did agree that co consensus is, does not lead to unanimity. But then let's let me take um, yes, uh, but he puts his hand down, and maybe there's um, a comment here by uh, Dr. Shiaqua. Uh, so if we even agree to your tenuous acceptance of of uh, consensus, then he says it's an it's interesting that, but let me see. But where does uh, this consensus lie? Is it among the elite or is it some, uh, an outcome that is generally uh, achieved? And uh, how will the actors be selected since we cannot practice? Yeah, so since it's not that kind of small Greek type of democracy. And then uh, Thomas O'Kine, uh, it cannot be doubted that consensus is compatible with the multi-party system, but what we need to seek to establish is that the near unanimity decision gives a more nationalistic perspective in decision making. So we can all agree that we want to make Ghana great or to we want to make Ghana a united country. So every other smaller uh, decisions we take, even when we disagree, but there is a, a larger, that's what I was saying, gradations. You know, so there is a larger consensus to not scatter Ghana. So if we don't have that, that seems to be his interpretation of weary which I, I agree, if we don't have that, because I'm, I'm denying that consensus is about everything. We really doesn't think that way. It would be funny if it does. <laughs> so, um, so I'll briefly just say I'm not a student of psychology, or philosophy at all. Uh, I'm a mathematician, and I want to return to the question of power. Again, because I think we're dealing with if it's a consensual agreement it's happening for a part of the communication, and if there are power structures that they organize or disorganize, whatever they might look like, then there are people who are not co-signatories in the room, and so the consensual decision favors the people who are part of the conversation. But then, is it a is it a decision or an agreement that is favorable to all, or how are we defining all? And who are the people who are not part of the form? But even that's uh, an agreement in that argument. So, uh, uh, salute to uh, Mohammed. Uh, hold your hand there. Are you salute? Are you able to ask that to come in? If you are still there.
Uh, Salif Mohammed, uh, are you still online? Uh, are you able to ask your question right now? Sorry for the delay in returning to your raised virtual hand. Oh, you have rescinded that decision. You have rescinded that decision to ask a question. My apologies for not returning to you earlier now. Yeah, Richmond, you have some reactions. Right. So, so I, I was saying uh, you make a, a very good point that um, the consensual decision, which we are characterizing as what is favorable or agreement to all, is good that the all day is going to be you know interpreted to mean all of us in this room, so to say. But that may not necessarily be um, what is the position of those outside of this room. So to try to get a nationalistic perspective. You know, it's always going to be a select few that are going to, you know, make the decisions, even if it is a consensual decision. So, but but the point I was making is that that goes to um, suggest or um, add to my point that the pursuit of consensus is not always always ideal in a situation where even those of us in this room uh, can come to a consensual agreement on something that has a national character may not actually be what is. Um, acceptable by majority of candidates. And that is why in some cases, the majoritarian principle works. Right? So, so it is not to say, uh, as we pointed out, that we have to have consensus on all, all, all decisions and that there are inherent problems with consensus itself. Right? And, um, and so my, my take is that, yes, uh, it's a value to cherish, but not and um, something that's essential to democracy that um, we should vigorously pursue it and that we should have that frame of mind. Even though having that frame of mind has you know, good consequences and all of that, but um, it, it has its own negatives. And I've highlighted some of the negatives to show that we can still pursue a democratic um, system without it. Um, uh, as I, as I uh, responded earlier, the power structures, um, um, personally, I don't have any, um, any problem with that. So those who articulate or advocate for consensual democracy also advocate for a non-party system because it's easier to adopt or to achieve consensus in decision-making when they, put, they don't have those vested individual interests. Political parties are there for power or for power and for their own interests. That is why it seems to be difficult to achieve consensus. But if there are no political parties, maybe some associations, um, maybe you know, farmers association, then we have farmers, you know, a representative to parliament. We have teachers, we have a representative to parliament. So the teacher is there for the interest of teachers or representing teachers. And whatever decision that we arrive at will be decisions that is favorable to all. But here we are not, it's not going to be adversarial, it's not going to be antagonistic because of the selection process. And 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 that seems to be, you know, um, that seems to work well for consensus. But our point is we don't need to break down the structures that we have now. We can still see how even in this power structures, even the multi-party majority system, we can see how it will work by not making consensus and consensual decision-making um, you know, um, um, an ideal, but rather as an emergent property, something that emerges from that, so that it is possible. Once, when we focus so much on the dialogue, the rational dialogue, um, as I said, the will to dialogue, if there's a will at all, the will to dialogue should necessarily be what democratic um, theories should be focusing on and not the frame of mind or the pursuit of consensus, which um, I've highlighted some errors that, that goes with it. Um, well, I mean, yes, uh, I don't know what you buy a nationalistic character that we do is, is advocating. Yeah, maybe fine. But uh, you and I will agree that reduce consensual democracy and what others have said seems to be far from, from you know, it being actualized in reality. It's not going to happen. Uh, so let's try to rather find ways in which you can incorporate 
the good, right, the, the positives of consensual democracy, even within the kind of political system that we have, rather than uh, having, um, so, so again, we'll still be um, taking a value that is indigenous, a value that is coming from our, uh, you know, African um, 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 pre-colonial societies. But uh, in order not to sound too anachronistic, in order not to do some of that blindly, um, we need to take away some of the things that doesn't make it work in our system and then see how we can make it work. And one of the ways we can make, make it work is to make consensus and a major property, even within the current political arrangements that we have. That's, that's the crux of, of um, what I'm suggesting. I think um, that should be it. Yeah. So uh, I know that we are almost welcome. Yes, out of time. Uh, so, but one last question that I would like you to consider is um, arises from how question and your response. So, uh, is there no representation? Is there no procedures for representation even in a consensual democratic system? Because um, what I know um, empirically is that depending on the issue, I, I, I keep saying that the, the issues are not always the same uh, of the same weight. So those who go into this room for a particular deliberation um, can come back home, in fact, frequently come back home because they're actually representative who are selected mostly on the base of integrity in traditional African setting. So, and uh, maybe also their age. So they go back if they don't have an answer and then consult their people, come back again and continue the conversation. In fact, both all sides. So it's not as if the room is closed to so external. So if you consider it that way, so maybe, okay, so that's what. And yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 I can agree with, with you on that. So, um, so again, um, there's no uh, predetermined mode of decision making in deliberation. So the outcome uh, may not always be consensual. That's why we can talk and still go back and consult the old lady, as we say in that time. So we consult, we come back, um, and then continue the, the deliberation. Now, if, what we emerge out of our deliberation could be an agreement by consensus, or it could be an agreement by majority principle, or it could be an agreement um, based on unanimity. So, so the agreement to, to that we emerge right, um, shouldn't already be constrained uh, or should already be determined by the kinds of arrangements and the psychology and the flow of mind that we come to deliberations with. So if we are going to have a rational dialogue, um, and uh, you know, to use a, a simple example, um, if, if the, you know, the couple are fighting, um, and oftentimes we call them to a meeting to resolve, to resolve the disagreement, right? to come and settle the dispute. So here again, the, 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 the point is, when we make up our mind to call them to a meeting to settle the dispute, that already constrains the way we are going to have the meeting with them because we are going to settle the matter. Uh, uh, but, but maybe it, it need not be settled, right? And the point is, uh, um, when, we, when we have that disposition to go and settle, it will inform the way we are going to talk to them. It will inform the way the deliberation will be done and everything. And I'm saying that uh, that, that, is, that it, is inessential to the dialogue or the deliberation we're going to take. Um, if that's at the end of the day, we dissolve their marriage. <laughs> um, um, fair, fair, fair enough, right? <laughs> right. I like that part a lot, that uh, closing comment. Uh, but I, 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 because we are now looking, okay, so the paper or your, the, your project, well, you want it to be as strong as possible. Uh, but, but so I'm looking at consensus itself. So, and you know, I was asking about characterizing it. So, is it not possible that part of the consensus we arrive at is that whatever 
that majoritarian decision might be taken. It might be part of the consensus we, we, we arrive at. So not that majoritarian uh, decision is an emergent, will be one of the emergent possibilities, but because we have already agreed that these are all possibilities. Uh, so if you think of it that way, but we are totally out of time and uh, let's take uh, some com uh, announcement from the organizers. Then. Thank you so much for the insightful presentation. Um, once again, we are grateful to the director of the Institute for the opportunity to have this presentation. Um, we also thank Dr. Richmond Chrissy for presenting the presenting us and enlightening us with what we have learned. I believe the conversation will continue even as we leave this place. I can see Dr. Chika Mba is really hyped up to continue with this. So um, I know we'll continue when we are done. Thank you, Dr. Mba, for chairing this. Next week, we have another seminar. That's the final seminar for this semester by Lore Carbonell, and it's on dance floors in Accra, an Afropolitan space, scenes of senses of collectiveness in some DJ scenes. So next week we will be dancing, we will be singing, we will be enjoying some good music here, and um, led by Lore Carbonell. So let's all be here at 12 p.m. And once again, thank you, Dr. Abu Bakari, for the hard work in putting this together. And thank you to all those who presented those both in person and online. We are grateful for your presence. See you all next week.